How's it going, everybody? The location we previously had scheduled got closed down due to the situation, and here we are today. You know, being stuck inside like this, smoking, reminds me of how far the cannabis industry has come since I was a kid. In the year 2020, citizen stoners have a greater responsibility than ever to take back the liberty we've been so long deprived of, growing and using cannabis for personal use. So join us here today to fight the good fight on Chronic Economics. Around the same time I was playing Game Boy Color Special Pikachu Edition Pokemon, my uncles Bubby and Richard were rolling up bags of Skunk Reggie, and they considered that to be dank. And today, Ohio has a medical system with about 10 times the variety. But, not everyone in Ohio is so lucky to enjoy that medical system. Ohio has a medical system that disposes you to a certain set of conditions to qualify. They are currently made up of specific diseases or injuries where cannabis has high rates of success with treatment. And each year there is a petition period for new conditions to be added. The fight for medical marijuana in Ohio is a great example of how we need to be vigilant in our fight here in the Southeast. But clip a roach on that conversation while I roll up to some West Coast history. I ain't how I'll tell you that, man. California legalized medical cannabis in 1996. With the bill Proposition 215, it allowed recommended access to a person with any illness to use and grow cannabis. Now, Diane Feinstein said there were loopholes in the bill so big that you could drive a truckload of marijuana through them. What? One of the loopholes Feinstein was referring to was the creation of caregiver collectives, which evolved into what we know as dispensaries or weed vendors today. While they were supposed to be a nonprofit organization to keep track of all the money being made and then siphon off fairly to local government, the DEA and feds had otherwise to say. Doctors and physicians were essentially threatened with license revocation, which forced any who weren't shaken up enough to file a speedy injunction in federal court on First Amendment grounds. The physicians won, but it earmarked a battle between federal and local government that persists even to this day in California. If the feds couldn't stop people from being recommended, they would have to enforce it on cultivators instead. The physicians won, but it earmarked a battle between federal and local government that persists even to this day in California. If the feds couldn't stop people from being recommended, they would have to enforce it on cultivators instead. As we spoke about in episode 1, California has the largest black market of cannabis within the state at $8 billion and another suspected $11 billion in exportations. Expect those exported figures to be quite smaller this year. California passed SB 420 in 2002 to address the need for government oversight and safer access for citizens against law enforcement. One thing the bill did was create a licensing system like we spoke about in Ohio. The next thing was allow for private industry to start pouring money into nonprofit medical cannabis. Fast forward into the present day and recognize California's recreational system as evidence of what profit incentive does to holistic medicine programs. All of the things that happened in California reflect the pushback that Coloradans got in 2000 when their medical program began. Within six years, caregivers began to roll out shop fronts to better serve a higher number of patients. But the State Department of Health, backed by the DEA, had otherwise to say. After a series of court battles, Sensible Colorado, a cannabis activist group in the area, won the ability for caregivers to have as many patients as they wanted around 2007, boosting the drive for dispensaries to be created within the state. However, in 2009, the Department of Health tried to have the ruling changed to a five-patient limit per caregiver, but failed, and this prompted a successful shift towards dispensaries within the state. Within the next year, a new batch of laws created a dual licensing system that would allow for more business owners to become stakeholders in the budding cannabis industry, while it forced more regulations on caregivers, like tracking exactly how much cannabis they were growing and where it went. In 2011, Colorado defined caregiver as an individual person, which dramatically affected the ability for shops to operate under the same statutes that they had been. I ain't how I'll tell you that. Now, if you don't know the story of Amendment 64 in Colorado, I'm going to give you some specifics. Amendment 64 was filed eight different times with Legislative Council in Denver, Colorado on May 20, 2011. All bills legalized possession of an ounce and retail shops for adult use. The different versions allowed citizens to see which specific one would pass the title setting. It also helped spread the petitions around for people to sign and stand behind the law that would become a constitutional amendment. November 6, 2012, the law came to pass, and in response, an executive order that created a task force handling implementation of the law. It also worked to reconcile Colorado and federal laws to ensure no one else could be prosecuted for Denver's decision. Those are examples of crawling before you walk. 
Down in Alabama, they're crawling toward legalization. A bill to legalize medical marijuana passed in the Senate and is heading to the House. So let's break down what happened. On Thursday, March 19th, 2020, the Alabama State Senate approved a medical marijuana bill that would allow certain types of use for certain medical conditions. Sponsored by Republican Tim Milson of Florence, Alabama, five hours of heated debate finally led Milson to a victory in the Senate. It has already faced opposition from the House of Representatives in the past, but Milson gave a positive outlook on the process. There could have been more of an organized effort to slow it down, and I appreciate not doing that, said Milson. A similar bill passed last year, but when it made it to the House, it became a Medical Cannabis Commission study instead. This bill would create a cannabis commission to oversee patient registries and licensed facilities within Alabama. During the five-hour debate, the Senate senators made several amendments, focused on licensing priorities for businesses through that commission. Three other senators gave specific opinions on how businesses deserved the ability to benefit from the medical cannabis industry. Davis Sessions, Republican of Grand Bay, Alabama, wanted to guarantee that farmers and businesses would be the first to benefit. Senator Arthur Orr of Decatur agreed with him, stating, I'm all for farmers if we have to go down this road, but now, some animals are more equal than others. I'm assuming his animal farm quote was either a reference to Democrat Bobby Singleton's amendment to the bill that required 20-25% to 25 of licenses to be granted to minorities, or could also have been upset that he felt one of his bills were mishandled, despite the fact that he entered several amendments to the bill, one of which was a decrease in daily patient dosage of 75mg to 50mg. While that didn't pass, he did manage to lower the doses of underage patients before making a spectacle on the entire bill in the first place. Or claimed he had enough as of being him to stop the passing of the bill altogether, but he let it go. Citing his fears for Alabama becoming a recreational legal state within 10 to 15 years and how much of a detriment that would be. As the bill is currently written, only adults 19 and older with qualifying conditions such as anxiety, autism, cancer-related illnesses, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, fibromyalgia, HIV-AIDS-related nausea or weight loss, PTSD, sleep disorders, Tourette's syndrome, and conditions causing chronic or intractable pain would have the ability to purchase a medical card for $65, and then the only form of use legalized in the system would be tablets or gel oil pills. Smoking, vaping, or consuming cannabis is forbidden by all these same laws. A basic way to think about this is if Alabama does get the medical program described, flowers are easily identified and still considered illegal. There are no protections for citizens created through the licensing system. They continue to treat it as contraband. Therefore, all the same side effects of the drug war are continued. And CBD flower has been staving off some of that pressure already, which is the reason states are facing federal court battles over it. Go watch Chronic Economics Episode 2 if you want more in-depth information about that. And now we gotta fire up the strokes for good old Uncle Bubby in the great state of Ohio. As we break down their medical marijuana debacle, you see, California and Colorado gave the ability for patients to grow their own cannabis, along with access, right? But Ohio didn't do that, and some of the other conservative states aren't doing it either. So we really need to check this out. When House Bill 523 passed in Ohio, it allowed for a handful of growers to supply an entire state of would-be patients. Those would-be patients have present-day complaints about a failing system. Advocates across the state like Robin Ann Morris organized Facebook groups such as We Grow Ohio to rally coalition support of a true adult use cannabis system. According to Morris, Ohio's system is not a true medical marijuana program. It's a recreational program in disguise for only the people with money and means to get it. As of March 2nd, reform advocates in Ohio managed to push a petition for better legalization titled Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol Act, but the attorneys general did not confirm the language. It would have let the Department of Commerce regulate the market and issue licenses to people. Now advocacy groups have to find an agreement with the attorneys general they managed to get 443,000 signatures to move the legislation forward. The pandemic is not making it easy on them or some other places moving forward. More on that later. This is an important argument that I only began to make in the last episode of Chronic Economics. You see, the stigma of cannabis here in the Southeast, combined with heavy regulation of controlled substances, can create some of the worst cannabis laws if we're not careful. When it comes down to it here in North Carolina where I am, the stigma over cannabis is still a huge problem to overcome. Whenever I'm outside of the inner city, I catch flack from smelling like weed or looking high as an adult in public. Within city limits, attitudes are far different, even from police officers. And it's the same in other huge metropolitan areas such as Atlanta, about four or five hours away from where I live. Atlanta has a burgeoning cannabis scene with everything from secret swap meets full of weed vendors to art collectives and weed tubers that support the cause. Whenever I ask how the city got so far ahead of everyone else in the Bible Belt, the repeated answer I get is a tight-knit community willing to help each other thrive. 
Events that allow people safe access to cannabis and ability to support upcoming distributors is an amazing thing to be a part of. I'm willing to put serious effort into making the situation similar or better here in Charlotte. So what can you do to get involved? If you're really motivated like me, write your own petition. I actually followed through with the steps on change.org to create a petition here in North Carolina, pushing for our right to grow cannabis for personal use. After studying the steps other states have taken in the last quarter century to access cannabis for both medical and recreational uses, I find that reinstating our ability to grow a medicinal herb specifically aligns with our American heritage of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you are a North Carolina citizen who is interested in this cause, follow the link in the description to sign and share it, or write your own petition. If you're still not motivated to help us with our cause, I need you to listen to this story from my friend in rural North Carolina and how he was affected by the drug war. So I got ran in on because I was selling a little bit of weed. And I had made like a ounce and a half to like two ounces of shake, if that, if it was two ounces, into like 33, 34 cereal bars. Well, I had eaten some, gotten rid of a couple, whatever, and uh, someone had snitched on me or had been snitching or whatever. And basically the way they did it was like, because I didn't let no one come to my house that I didn't know. And like, so I guess they knew they couldn't like come and sell to them directly or whatever. So they fucking, they sent somebody, they basically searched their car or whatever, gave them the money, sent them to my house to get the stuff. And then like people would smoke, they could smoke with me, whatever, and then go back and take it to them. Which is kind of whack. Like that's kind of bullshit. But they fucking charged me for the whole weight of the cereal bars. I had like 25 of them. I, don't, I can't even really tell you because I didn't even see the evidence that they found in my house. I didn't sign for my own evidence. Shit's kind of wild. I was like 20, I was like 20 or 21, I think. You know, grown, grown adult. And they had my stepfather sign for my shit. And like, I paid rent to stay there. I had a padlock on my door, like, all kind of shit. And they just, like, busted on in, flashbanged my house. No one was in there, thankfully, but my dogs. Uh, fucking wild shit. They pulled me out of my car at a stoplight. Like, cause at the time, my window was, like, stuck down and wouldn't roll up. So they, they pulled up behind me at a stoplight, and the dude gets out of his car wearing, like, a football jersey and, like, a, his hat backwards and sunglasses on, pulls his, like, badge out from underneath his jersey and, like, opens my door, like, because, like I said, my window was stuck down. Like, opens my door and is like, yeah, I got a warrant to search your vehicle, pulls me out, puts me in handcuffs, pats me down. And they were like, we can either tow your vehicle or we can drive it to your house. So they drove my trunk to my house. And that's when they started searching or whatever. Found the cereal bars. They found, like... An ounce of bud, maybe an ounce and a half of bud, like eight grams of wax, I think, and then like, like I said, like 25, 26 cereal bars, charged me with five pounds, I was looking at like five, I think five or six felonies, I think folks, I think it's five, it was wild shit, got charged for having five pounds over less than $300 worth of cereal bars, really, and fucking an ounce of bud. Ounce and a half of blood. <laughs> oh, your barn? Oh yeah, that's the that's the best part. So this is my first charge too, by the way. Never had been in trouble before. Never nothing. Fucking, they hit me with a hundred k. Boy, was they pissed when I bonded out. They hit me with a hundred k bond. They hit me with a hundred k bond. So I had to pay ten to get out. They were super pissed because like I got into the holding cell. Like, the whole time they were trying to get me to snitch and shit on everybody, you know, obviously they do everybody. Fucking, talking like everyone does it, duh, duh, duh. I'm like, I don't care, bro, I'm not doing it. I got me fucked up. I was like, give me my charges, let me get out of here. I was like, I'm about to bail out. Hit me with a 100k fucking bond. They were like, you still bailing out? I was like, yeah, I am. Um, boy, the look on their face, they were so fucking pissed off. But, first charge ever for $300 went to your bars, gave me a 100k bond. We apologize. That last segment's made for a long form interview, but we had to cut it short because of the COVID-19 virus. Anyway, on the next episode of Chronic Economics, we're gonna follow up on just how the pandemic's affecting us in the cannabis community. We thought it was gonna be a great 420, but now it's gonna be a little bit different. We know for a fact we're gonna be smoking with all the same loved ones and friends we always do, that's for sure. So, thanks for watching. Have a great time.